Let's be seated, shall we? And let's just ask God to open our hearts to his word today. Heavenly Father, indeed, would you open our hearts to the Bible? We believe the Bible is true. It is a lamp unto our feet and unto a light unto our path, Lord. Speak to us, please, from heaven. Speak into our hearts and into our lives. May we not waste this time, but may we be attentive and give our very best, believing that God himself is addressing us through the Bible. Lord, be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is a huge difference between going to church and being the church. I hope we're understanding that. It's a huge difference between just turning up, which you're welcome to do, by the way. If you are turned up this morning, we're glad you're here. But there's a huge difference between just turning up and actually becoming this amazing outpost of heaven in Overland Park called the church. The church is an outpost of heaven. We are playing away from home. We are always playing away from home until we're called home to Jesus. We're on foreign turf, and it's always harder to play away from home. And the book of Romans takes 11 chapters speaking of the wonders of Jesus and the gospel. And then the last five chapters talking about how do we respond now? How do we live as believers? We can ask the question, how do justified sinners live? The word justified means to be declared right by God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what justified means. It's the most important word perhaps in the book of Romans. But the question is, how do justified sinners live? And we need to add a word to that question. How do justified sinners live together? How do we live together? There is not even a hint in the New Testament of an understanding that I can live out the Christian life on my own. There is no picture in the Bible of the lone ranger Christian who says it's just me and Jesus. It is not just me and Jesus. It's us together and Jesus. The question, do you have to go to church to be a Christian, is a question that the New Testament doesn't ask. It assumes that when someone is a believer in Jesus, they become part of the people of Jesus. If we want to put it in a fancy sentence, we can put it this way. Orthodoxy, it just means right belief. Orthodoxy of doctrine must be twinned with orthodoxy of culture. In other words, I cannot believe right, but then live wrong toward you. I can't do that. Believing right is matched by living right together. Now, the Bible is called many, it calls the church many things. One of the things it calls the church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. There's an awful lot of bride bashing that goes on these days. Bride abuse. There's an awful lot of people who say, well, I'm fine with Jesus, but I just can't stand the church. You can't say those things. If someone were to come to me and nobody has ever dared, and though now almost 65, I would still fight like a tiger at this one. If someone ever came to me and said, John, I really like you, but I just can't stand your wife. My response would be, I'm sorry, but you don't like me then. Because I live for my bride. The most important thing in the universe to Jesus is his bride. Jesus loves everybody, but he loves his bride special. You would expect him to, wouldn't you? You would expect me to love my bride 
in a special way. Awful lot of bride bashing going on. We dare not. Oh, you dare not. You can be concerned for the church. You dare not criticize the bride of Christ. Pray for it. Serve it. Weep for it. Love it. Don't bash it. So in Romans 12, we get into Christian living. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is how do I respond to God? We looked at that last week. I offer my soul, whole self to him as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It's the only reasonable response. Romans 12, beginning with verse 3, and then all the way to the end of Romans is how do I respond to people? How do I respond to myself? How do I respond to you? How do I re respond to the world outside? And we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to fly through Romans 12. Paul did not give a command in the book of Romans until chapter 12. In chapter 12, there are 27 commands. Count them yourself in one chapter. We're not going to hit every one of them this morning, but you, you could take your Bible and pray through them. Lord Jesus, work these things in me. Work these things in my life. First of all, we need to understand, number one, we belong to one another. I belong to you. We are a body together. Look in chapter 12, look at verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function so we, though many, are one body in Christ. A bride, a body, these are word pictures. We are a body together. I cannot follow Jesus on my own. It's not Christianity. It's something else. This is a community of believers. So here come these 26 commands. The first begins in verse 3. We're not going to do all 26 of them. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment. I relate to God by giving my whole self to him. I relate to myself by not thinking too highly of myself. Look at verse 16. He echoes it again. Never be haughty hear you say haughty. In Cornwall, they would say haughty. So I'm going in the middle. Never be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own eyes. If I think too highly of myself, I will automatically, of necessity, think too lowly of you. If I view others right through the eyes of the gospel then I am being balanced. Brothers and sisters, we are living in an age where everybody is thinking too highly of themselves. My goodness, we're throwing things around on Facebook and Instagram and everybody's an expert in their opinion. And we're doing incredible damage. I have to relate to me and verse 3 and verse 16 in this passage tell me that the way I relate to myself is with sober judgment. I have been redeemed from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ and I am a member of the body of Jesus. And I dare, I dare, I dare not exalt myself over another. The word haughty means arrogant and superior. Never be wise in your own sight, verse 16. And again, these days, just everybody is wise in their own sight. I know more than you about everything. I know more about, than you about COVID and about masks and about vaccinations and about politics. And I know more than you about everything. And if you don't agree with me, then you're canceled. 
For by the grace given to me, Paul says, in other words, I'm only saying this to you because Jesus loves me. By the grace given to me, I say to you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment. Before you barge in with guns blazing to set that brother straight, go before Jesus. Think of the grace that's been given to you, to me, undeserved favor. Consider that that person that you're ready to wipe the floor with is a blood-bought treasure of God, infinitely valuable to the Lord Jesus. I have to have a right view of myself. And I guess... By not thinking of myself more highly than I ought, it also means I shouldn't go around saying that I'm a worthless piece of trash because I'm not purchased by the blood of Jesus. But my goodness, if we all in this nation, let alone in this church, would think of ourselves with sober judgment, wouldn't we live in a different world? The longer I follow Jesus, the more convinced I am that he is Lord and the more convinced I am that I don't know anything. And I just need to be quiet and serve. And then I need a right view of others. Look at verses 4 through 8. For as in one body we have many members and so all members do not have the same function, so we though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I view you, I must view you as one for whom Christ died. Of infinite value, I must view you through the gospel. Not just at surface level. We are members of one another. And then he says we all have gifts differing according to the grace that's given us. And we should use them in proportion to our faith. We're not going to go through this small list of gifts here. But here's the glorious thing. Every single person in the body of Christ, every single one of us, is gifted by God. And in a healthy church, we will do everything we can, please hear this, to champion one another's spiritual gifting. The greatest spectator sport in America is not football, it's church. Where we come and we watch the paid professional use his gift. And that is not the body of Christ. Oh, Lord Jesus, would you cause Westbrook to be a place where each one of us discovers what gifts we have received by the grace of God to serve the cause of Jesus in this world, and we champion that in one another. Every single one of us is graced by God and gifted for service. This is not a spectator sport. Please say amen to that. And and let's find this out. And let's discover. And let's champion. And let's believe the best. Let's build a whole new gospel-centered culture. We sometimes say in our elders' meetings and such, tongue-in-cheek, that the vast majority of the church of Jesus is good for nothing. By that we mean this, they're not paid, and they're still good. They are serving Jesus because God has called them. The vast majority of the church is not the the few who are paid to do their job. They are people who are good, serving the Lord Jesus, only because they've been graced with gifts. You get what I mean by good for nothing there? All right, I'm not insulting, I'm commending. So we're going to do this thing again that you all hate. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are good for nothing. 
wonderful. About three or four of us in this church are good for something. We've been paid to be good. The rest of you are just good for nothing. And it's wonderful. That's the body of Jesus. And listen to this. Listen. Every Christian who genuinely walks with Jesus knows something wonderful about Jesus that you have yet to discover. You might be the best Bible teacher in this church, or you might have a PhD, or you might have all sorts of Christian lineage in your life, but there is someone in this church, every person in this church, who has a genuine walk with Jesus, knows something wonderful about Jesus that you don't know, and I don't know, because Jesus is so wonderfully multifaceted. So before one of us starts thinking, I got the goods on my brother or sister, that brother or sister has experienced God in ways you don't even imagine. Honor them. Honor them. Discover what you can from them about the goodness and graces of Jesus. And then a right understanding of love. Look at verses 9 through 13. I'm going to read this chapter, this, this paragraph. Love must be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Isn't that beautiful? Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now, that paragraph right there is a whole prayer meeting. You could take that, prayer, that paragraph and get on your knees before God and pray that into your life. But it begins with the word, love must be genuine. Let love be genuine. We have to pause there for just a moment. Because my neighbor has a sign in their yard that says love is love. But this tells me there's such a thing as disingenuous love. Love that is fake love. Love that parades is love, but it's not really love. The statement love is love is unqualified. And what it's trying to tell you and me is this. Anything goes as long as it's under the banner of love. Nobody believes that. My neighbor doesn't believe that. You can't believe that. Paul says love has to be genuine. And the first thing love does is it hates evil. Hates it. It hates fake love. It hates destructive love. It hates the thing that parades is love that really breaks people and ruins lives. A Christ-like attitude toward love. And the word there for love is this amazing Bible word, agape. It means the unconditional commitment to another's well-being. It has nothing to do with feelings. Nothing to do with, not this word here. It has nothing to do with with feelings. And so far in the book of Romans, the word love, agape, has only been used to refer to God's love to us. Here it's being used for my love to others. There's a little slide that's going to go up here of a young lady. Agape should cause your mouth to go agape. It should. When your mouth is agape, it's because you're amazed. And the most amazing thing in the universe is agape. The unconditional love from the Father through the Son to us in redeeming us that now we share with our world. I hope agape has caused your mouth to go agape. I hope you're not thinking, oh, interesting point. Hmm. We should be overwhelmed with the wonders of the agape love 
of God. Oh God, you loved me through Jesus and now you're filling me with love so I can love people unconditionally committed to their well-being no matter what it costs me? Wow. That's love. I don't know what love is love means. Well, I know what they're trying to say. It's an impossible statement. It's absurd. Love is expressed to us through the gospel, through Jesus Christ. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. You can't do anything in that paragraph by yourself. Christianity is a team sport. You can put a basketball hoop up in your driveway. You can slam dunk if you lower it enough, make yourself feel real good. You can spin the ball on your finger. You can dribble between your legs. You can shoot free throws like crazy all by yourself. It doesn't make you a basketball player because it's a team sport. And in order to play basketball, you've got to join a team, even a lousy team. Then you're a player. This is a team sport. And then we have a relationship toward our enemies, a right relationship toward our enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is radical. This is a whole different culture. The word bless means to speak well of. Wow. Everybody's cursing everyone these days. Have you noticed? I hope, and I mean this, I hope you do not enjoy going on YouTube and watching your political enemy commit a gaffe. Tumble down some stairs or forget what he's going to say. Or, that's not Christ-like. It's evil. Bless those who persecute. Speak well of them. This is not a suggestion. It's a command. Look at this. Number one, I have five things in this. Number one, be willing to be wronged. Look at verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Be willing to be wronged. Jesus will vindicate me. Number 18, or verse 18, pursue peace. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everybody. Actually, pursue peace. This is a superpower. It's not being weak. It's not being just mindlessly passive. It's a superpower. Verse 19, refuse re revenge and trust God. Beloved, never offend your, avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. My vengeance will always be miscalculated. Always. Either it'll be too hard or too soft. Leave it to God. Some of you are angry at people and you've been angry with people for so long it's eating you up. Jump ahead to the slide of Corey Ten Boom, if you will. Corey Ten Boom. You know the story, perhaps, imprisoned in Ravensbrook prison camp in World War II. Her sister was killed there. Listen to what Corey said. Those able to forgive their former enemies were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives no matter what their physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. I wish Corey Ten Boom could preach to this whole nation. Number 20, to do good to those who do evil. Verse 20, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That strange statement, heap burning coals, simply means somehow culturally there, you will lead him to shameful repentance. 
Do good to those who do evil. Do you see the, the radical new culture Christianity is? Our answer to that world is a whole new culture. It's not just thinking we're better than them because we go to church. It's a whole new culture. We're going to bless our enemies. And in so doing, we're going to overcome evil. Verse 29, verse 21, overcome evil with good. I want to take a few minutes and tell you the story of my friend Dan Bauman. Now, I call him my friend. He's my acquaintance. This picture is going to come up here. Uh, Dan is actually a very good friend of our children. Had dinner with our kids Friday night, actually. Uh, Dan Bauman... Is a, minister, is a missionary with Youth with a Mission. Um, and he's a remarkable follower of Jesus. And about 20 years ago, he was in Iran spreading the love of Christ. And he was falsely accused of espionage, and he was arrested and imprisoned. And I have four copies of his book here, by the way, called Cell 58. And for the first four dads who come up to me, you'll get this book and you can read it to your kids. Okay? Dan Bauman, we, we could actually perhaps one day get, Bauman, get Dan Bauman to speak in this church. But in this book, he tells the story about the guards standing outside his cell. It's strange, said one of the guards. I stand by his cell and I hear him praying for us. He's doing all of this for love? We know nothing about this God of love, but it sounds very right. Now, we're going to watch a two and a half minute clip of Dan. Now, before this, this clip plays, I need to tell you this. Uh, about six years ago, Dan Bauman fell off a cliff and had a catastrophic head injury and was told he would be vegetative for the rest of his life. This clip is since that, okay? Every now and then his speech is a little funny, but he's, we were, we were in an audience the first time he stood in front of people and spoke again. We were there. So I want you to hear Dan Bauman, and I want you to think about blessing your enemies. I want you to hear this man, okay? Throughout my life, I've seen God's goodness and seen the power of love. One of the greatest times was when I was imprisoned in Iran. With two death sentences on my life in Iran a few years ago, I never knew if I'd ever get out. But one of the big challenges I had there was God challenging me to love my enemies. I ended up being beaten every day by one man. He was my interrogator. And it was through this process of being there with him that God challenged me to love him. God challenged me to look at him through the eyes of God. At first, this was, seemed impossible because everything was about me. But over time, God radically changed my heart. I began to bless this man and love this man. And I'll never forget the last day I saw him. I had no idea it would be the last day I'd see him. But as usual, he took me to the interrogation room. And with bloodstains on the floor, I would stand there in fear. And it was on that day that the love and power of God came over me. And I looked at him and I said, Sir... If I'm going to see you the rest of my life, let's become friends. He scoffed at me and said, never. And then I said again, sir, let's start by exchanging names. Let's become friends today. We had never exchanged names because that wasn't allowed. As I stuck out my hand to shake his hand, he froze. When he froze, then he started to shake. As he started to shake, he started to look around the room. As he looked around the room, all of a sudden his hand came out of his pocket and he reached it towards me and he shook my hand. When he shook my hand, all of a sudden he started to weep and tears started to flow down his face. It was then that he looked at me and he said these simple words, Dan, my name is Rizal and I would love to be your friend. And it was at that moment that I knew, knew that there was no heart too hard for Jesus. That even in my darkest hour, even with the greatest enemy right before me, the power of love was real and it changed his heart.
Is that glorious? Four copies of Cell 58. You can get it on Amazon if you miss out. But first four dads, I'd love you to read this to your kids. Teach your kids to live for Jesus. Teach them to live in a radically new culture. Teach them that they may suffer for Christ, but it will be worth it. Brothers and sisters, as we go through the book of Romans, this is not just an exercise to download knowledge. It's about understanding that Jesus, who purchased us from sin to God by his blood, wants in his church to build a new culture. A culture where people think rightly about themselves. They're no longer flinging arrows at everyone in haughtiness and pride. A church where we value one another as members, realizing that each person is uniquely graced and gifted by God, that together we might promote the glory of Jesus in a needy world. A church where love is genuine, agape love, at which our mouths are agape with constant amazement. And a church where we actually bless our enemies and where we actually overcome evil with good and we leave vengeance to God and we pursue, we actively pursue peace. And I would just suggest to you the world has no answer for that community other than to see Christ in it. And that must be the goal for Westbrook Church. Anything less is sub-Christian. It's not enough to be orthodox in our official doctrine. We have to be orthodox in our culture, in the type of people we hope to be. I don't know if you'll ever be faced with what Dan, Dan Bauman or Corey Ten Boom was faced with. I, I'm not going to say I hope not, because God ordains these things for us. But if you truly present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him, you will be faced with impossible situations in which Jesus can shine. You heard what Dan said. I realized then that nothing is too great for the love of Jesus. Can we believe that together? Let's stand together and let's open our hearts to the Lord. We're going to sing in a moment, but let's open our hearts as a company of people to the Lord. Lord, would you indeed come to this, this fellowship of believers, this really beautiful fellowship of believers, and would you... By your grace, Lord, continue to shape us, us of all people, us, Lord, into a body, into a bride, into a culture that reflects the gospel to our world. Lord, would you work miracles in us, Lord? Would you cause us, Lord, to think humbly of ourselves, to not be haughty, to not be wise in our own eyes, would you cause us, Lord, to recognize that we together are the body of Christ? Would you cause us to value one another and the grace given to each one of us? And may we champion one another in the giftings you've given us. Please, Lord, deliver us from being a spectator sport. Make us a whole bunch of people who are good for nothing, Lord. Lord, and may our love be genuine, Lord. Just this amazing agape love flowing from you right into us and out to this world, even as we abhor evil. Lord, may we outdo one another in showing honor to each other. And Lord, when the time comes, may we bless those who persecute us, Lord, and not curse them. Lord, may we seek to live peaceably with every person, but Lord, knowing that someday we may have to leave vengeance to you because we will be mistreated. Lord, give us grace to overcome evil with good and know that nothing is too big for the love of Jesus Christ. 
Lord, work this in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.